Welcome to Fridays with a Forester. This is our last Fridays with a Forester for the 2023 season. This is April 28th, 2023. Uh, our topic is participatory science or citizen science, as we call it before, uh, on invasive species. And again, uh, my name is Gary Wyatt with the Extension, uh, University of Minnesota Extension Educator at uh, Forestry at the Mankato Regional Office. And today we also, we have Lauren Backus from the Regional Office in Andover, and she's helping host our webinar today. We really appreciate her help. And she's been almost at every webinar that we've had on Fridays with the Forester. Thank you, Lauren. Today's topic and speaker is participatory science. Uh, say that uh, pretty fast. Anyway, uh, that's uh, the old the old term is citizen science, but participatory science is more of a, a, a broader term for everybody participating in science. Uh, and spotted lanternfly, mock uh, strawberry, and garlic mustard aphids will be our topic. Our speaker today is Angela Gupta, our uh, Extension Forestry uh, faculty member at the Rochester Regional Office. And Angie is uh, pictured there and also her uh, contact information. And we'll have her contact information later as well. So this is a webinar. This is a, a Zoom webinar. So we don't see your pictures, uh, but we can uh, see you in uh, the Q&A and the chat. We are urging all the questions to be put in the Q&A. But if you have some uh, web links or some ideas or some comments that you want to put in the chat, please do. We'll both address the Q&A and the chat at the end of Angela's presentation. And we'll try and end at 10 o'clock, but we will go over if there's questions that uh, are still continuing to come in. Also, again, our webinars are recorded and posted at the uh, YouTube website, z.umn.edu slash Fridays with an S, and you can access those at any time. And actually, you can see last year's uh, Fridays with a Forester as well with Matt Russell and myself. Angie, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll let you start. There we go. Very good. Looks good. Full screen. Oh, I'm mute. Perfect. So good morning. Thank you for having me, Gary. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. So I'm going to talk about our 2023 participatory science projects, and we're launching three this spring. So two have launched this week, and one will wait until uh, June to launch. But they are all related to, to non-native species that we think might become troublesome or we're interested in that are um, new to the state, or, or we're not sure their distribution and density because we don't um, don't have good data on them. So we're asking folks like yourselves to please help us look for that information. So there we go. So first I wanna define participatory science. So it is, uh, it, participatory science engages the public in advancing scientific knowledge by formulating research questions, collecting data and interpreting results. So actually all three parts of the scientific process, not just collecting data. So most of the work I'm going to talk to you about that we're launching in 2023 is data collection, but I have done projects um, in the last few years that have also asked community members to help uh, generate research questions and to interpret data. And so I've really enjoyed working with uh, community members and volunteers to really help do the whole suite of scientific inquiry. And this is this definition is from the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and Gary is right, formally, and still there are some that call this field citizen science. And I'm happy to talk about common names and these changes that we're seeing in terminology at the end if there are questions. Um, but I'll just say I much prefer the term participatory science because I think it is it is more encompassing of the suite of things that people can do related to science. And then I thought it was interesting. I served on uh, any global pandemics um, committee that actually preceded the pandemic. So clearly there still work to be done there. Um, but participatory science is much more commonly used in other fields, like not natural resources. So that's the term you would see used in like the medical industry. And so anyway, I think there's a consolidation around one term for, for all of these things. All right. So um, this is a slide that is related to what we're now calling the TIPS, so Terrestrial Invasive Participatory Science. So you're going to start to see that TIPS um, uh, shortening in a lot of our materials coming out of University of Minnesota Extension. And these are all projects that I started that are participatory science um, since 2020. And so it, it was decisions that were made in late 2019, so pre-pandemic decisions that enabled me 
to do a little less of traditional um, programming that we've been doing around forest pest first detector and instead ramp up this participatory science work. Uh, then of course COVID happened, really changed the world that we live in. And it turned out that all of my 2020 programs related to participatory science could be done either during stay at home and while social distancing. And so I was encouraged to roll out more participatory science projects because it was one of the few things that we could really roll out that was still safe and comfortable for people to do. And, and this triangle at the top is meant to sort of um, talk about the level of, of engagement, repeat activity that a volunteer participant might need to do throughout a project. And here on the left are some that I really viewed to be crowdsourcing. And so anybody can do it typically just with a phone um, and it's sort of catch as catch can. It's pretty low bar for entry, but and really easy to participate. And then there are projects that were much more engaged that, re that required repeat engagement into the project, um, checking over time, uh, reporting repeatedly. And the Jumping Room Report Management Project is one of the projects where the community ended up coming up with questions that, that we ended up investigating and Master Naturals helped to do uh, some of the peer reviewed literature review and the data summary to inform that project. So that jumping worm project, I really felt like it included the sort of the scope of things. It was more like this half, so it was a lot more heavy engagement, but it really included a broader scope of participatory science activities. Anyway, um, all of these things can be found, both current and former projects at this Google site. And so I'm gonna actually leave and go over there. And so this is the live Google site. So you guys can all go to the site. You can um, put in, here's the Z link. Let me bounce back over. And this is the Z link. And um, maybe Lauren or Gary could drop that into the chat for everyone. Sorry, I didn't think to, to preload you with those before. Um, but this will take you to this website. And like I said, it's live. And uh, these two, garlic mustard aphid and spotter and the mock strawberry, I'll talk more about in my slides, but recognize that all of the information is here. So I'm not actually gonna cover all of this information today, um, but this is the type of things that you would find that we would include in an email or in a social media link that would send you right to this page. And then you can learn about all of this information. Uh, similarly, here's mock strawberry all of the information about that. This is pretty short. Uh, and then spotter lanternfly, it's not 100% done. So it says starting in May. And I think I actually need to change that to June. Um, and this is a lot more detailed. So I'll talk about that in a moment too, because there's a lot more going on with this project. But as I was sort of talking about um, in those first introductory slides, all of our completed work can also be found here. So, you know, if you wanted to learn more about jumping worms, that is a very hot topic this time of year with plant sales. Um, so you can see final update winter 2023, but all of the information can be found here. So this is loading slowly, but I promise it will come. Here it is. And so you can see the final report updates. These are intermediate reports. Here's some of what we did. All of the information can be found here, including things like why emotion matters. Um, that was one of the investigatory questions that we answered as a result of the community. Um, so I share this because there's really kind of a lot of information hidden in that little tab. Um, and then I want to share this. I feel like this is a, a success story here. So this is a project that we did in 2020 that required more engagement. We had volunteers go out and check trees in the spring during flower and in the fall after leaf off to look for fruit. Um, and we were looking for amber cork trees, typically in boulevards and community areas to assess whether they were switching gender and if the females were producing fruit and those fruit could become invasive. And I am delighted to report, well, I'm not delighted. Um, unfortunately for us, I think that these trees were indeed switching. So we could tell that they, trees that have produced male flowers in June were, then went on in November to produce fruit, which can only be done with female flowers. So the trees, the individual, individual trees were switching. And that means that the amarcourt tree males can have the potential to become invasive. Um, and so that research was done with participatory science, and then it helps inform the Minnesota Noxious Weed Advisory Committee. 
And as a result of all of that, uh, they changed Minnesota state law in this past December, December of 2022. Um, and so now any fruit producing Amherst cork trees in the state need to be removed so that they don't become invasive. Um, but I'm just delighted it's an impact of participatory science. Um, and I'm happy to take more questions. There's some other interesting things about that project, but my point is that you guys make a difference. So when you do these things that we ask, people really do pay attention. And, and ultimately this can get into systems, can, can make quite a bit more difference. So I see a couple of um, things coming into the chat. Uh, before I get moving much further, are there any questions, Gary, that you think I should answer now? I think we're good right now. Awesome, okay. Um, so the first, the first project that has just rolled out, um, it, it rolled out this week actually, is a project looking at mock strawberry. And so mock strawberry is a new species to the state of Minnesota, we think. We don't actually have good data on it. Um, it is not native. I don't have the definition between not native and, uh, and invasive and weed in here, but I'll go ahead and just say it. So um, species that are are weeds, are plants that are out of place. So it can be anything in a place that you don't want it. So a dandelion in the middle of your beautiful yard could be considered a weed. Um, a corn plant in a soybean field is considered a weed. And uh, a, a buckthorn in a forest that you're managing for natives is considered a weed. You can also have things that are non-native, but not considered weeds and not considered problematic. So things like, uh, most if not all of our apple trees in the state are non-native, but we take a lot of pride in them. And we do not consider them invasive because they do not cause economic, ecological, or human health harm. And then we have things that are invasive. So those are things that are non-native and cause ecological, economic, or human health harm. And so first we have to establish its nativeness and then we have to establish if it's, if it's causing harm. And for mock strawberry, all we know of it's not native, that is not native, we do not know if it's causing any harm. So what we're trying to learn with this project is just simply ask people to be on the lookout for Mark Strawberry and report it to EdMaps. And so I'll bounce back right over to here. And if you were to go into this site, you would see these descriptions. There is a, a great short, it's a little under five minutes video about how to use EdMaps. And that's all you have to do. So I view this to be a crowdsourcing type project. Um, but a couple of key characteristics about mock strawberry. So um, it looks a lot like our native wild strawberry. Uh, it has the three leaves. It is a, it's a, it's a spreading vine. The two important differences I think that make identification pretty easy is our native strawberry has a white flower and mock strawberry has a yellow flower. And then these are the fruits of mock strawberry. So they look really similar. Uh, the fruits of our native native wild strawberry are black, the actual seeds, and they seem to be recessed in the strawberry. Whereas on mock strawberry, they like sit perched on the outside of the berry and they're kind of the same red color. Uh, you can pop one of these mock strawberries in your mouth and it doesn't taste like anything. It's not like the sweet tasting strawberry that you're accustomed to. So um, for identification purposes, it's pretty handy. Um, it's relatively unusual in a plant that they will bloom and fruit at the same time, but that is very common in, in this plant. And so it's really easy to see that yellow flower and that fruit and be able to identify it. Um, it also is likely to start blooming here pretty quickly, and it is likely to persist to bloom throughout the growing season. Uh, and we've been finding it, I didn't include the map, um, uh, from Edna Maps here, but we have been finding it as far south as Southeast Minnesota and as far north as the North Shore. Thus far, we've only found it on the Eastern edge of Minnesota, lots of reports in the Twin Cities, but we don't think anybody's really been looking for it. So that's what we really want people to pay attention to. And we would like reports of Mock Strawberry. We don't really want a ton of yard reports, um, but we do want reports of it. We do not understand where it is in the state. So if you want to put one report in from your yard and it, make it a polygon, that's fine. Um, we're most interested in natural areas. All right, I see two questions in the Q&A. Should I pause? Are they related to mock strawberry or should I keep going? Um, doesn't look like they're related to mock strawberry, but I can certainly read them off if you want them. Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay, first one is there is a huge mass of Siberian squill inside our neighborhood dog park. Should I report that? Yes, please. 
And so this person might have been noticing that in a previous project, we reported Siberian squill. And so um, these, this is Siberian squill from a final report project a couple of years ago. Um, and Siberian squill is a non-native plant. It is considered invasive and um, it is, it can cause problems in our woods. And we would like reports um, in ed maps for anywhere that is considered uh, it is in a naturalized area, so it's not being tended and managed. Um, I didn't really talk about this, but I may go ahead. I, I sort of briefly mentioned it. Um, so many of these plants that we consider to be invasive in Minnesota will potentially end up on the Minnesota noxious weed list. And I do believe, yeah, Siberian tree, tree shrub is right there. So what that means is it's illegal to sell in the state of Minnesota. And you can see that this has cultivar exceptions. Um, and that is a kind of a common political compromise for plants that are in trade. And, and this is under the restricted list. So uh, you're not allowed to, 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 um, to sell and move propagating parts, import, transport, or sell those propagating parts, but you do not have to remove it. So up here, these plants you would have to remove and kill, um, but further down the list, you do not. And since I'm here, I will show you amber cork tree, which was a new addition, right? It just was added to the list. And that again is as a result of some participatory science work. Any other questions I should take now, Lauren? Uh, one other one says, does the state pay for the taking of the trees? No, the state does not. So in these, um, prohibited eradicate list that, that it is required that landowners remove the plant or kill it really is what's required. Um, the state has been successful at various times in getting grants to help uh, landowners to do that work, but it has been very much a catch as catch can, can in the grant world. There's an effort happening right now at the state legislature to try to get recurring funding, um, annual recurring funding, and it's a rocky path. Um, but it is up to the individual, the short answer. All right, hearing no more questions about mock strawberry, I'll, I'll keep going then. Um, so the next one we're gonna start and this will launch officially next week. It's probably still a smidge earlier. Our, our spring has been so slow in, in emerging, but this is a, a, a project really looking for garlic mustard aphid. So I imagine many of you are familiar with garlic mustard. So that's an invasive plant that's pretty common in our woods, for, certainly in the Southeast Minnesota and the Twin Cities, but really, um, unfortunately it's distributed fairly broadly across the state. Uh, and it is an early, it's a, it's a spring, early spring plant. So it, it overwinters, buck, or garlic mustard completely overwinters green under the snow. And as soon as the snow melts, in a, the rosettes, the first year plants are, are there and ready to photosynthesize. Um, and fairly quickly, once the spring really gets going, those first year rosettes will bolt and they will bloom typically in May in Minnesota um, into pretty white. They are uh, often enjoyable to look at, so they're pretty. They are white and they're fairly conspicuous in the understory. And lots of people do um, garlic mustard removal events. Recently, a non-native insect, a garlic mustard aphid, has been found on garlic mustards across the upper Midwest. And there's interest in understanding what is going on. So this is a native host in garlic mustard native in garlic mustard's native range. We do not know how garlic mustard got introduced. So Occasionally, we will look for biocontrols. So we will bring a pest from a native range of an invasive species, and we will intentionally, after a lot of regulatory review, introduce it into the United States to manage that invasive pest. We have certainly done that with insects before. So you might um, be familiar with things like um, um, purple loosestrife. And so there are some insects that can be moved around for purple loosestrife. Uh, and so that is a thing. That is not what happened here. What happened here is this insect appeared and now we're trying to understand it. And so, um, and I, I was trying to understand like, is this good news? Like this, might this solve our garlic mustard problem? And I was assured it probably is not going to, but we don't really know. And it does seem to prevent garlic mustard from going to seed or at least significantly reducing the seed 
volume that might be produced from an individual plant. So right now, we're just asking you to report garlic mustard aphid. So if you're out there looking at garlic mustard, you're pulling garlic mustard, you're harvesting garlic mustard, you're killing garlic mustard, whatever you're doing with garlic mustard, if you notice damage, and I'll bounce over to my website because I think it's a little bit better there. So um, what we're trying to do, protect our spring ephemerals. This is how tiny the aphid is. If you see the aphid, for sure, report that. But we are happy with reports of damage. So if you see damage either to the flower, to the seed, to the stem, anything, we would like you to report that. Um, it is, use, we, we need good ID pictures, right? And that can be tricky. This is with a, a lens on a camera. So you're gonna have to be very careful to take good ID pictures of this one. Um, and then this one is actually, it's, it's not exactly being organized centrally, but a bunch of states are actually asking volunteers to look for garlic mustard aphid this year. And one reporter in Illinois is actually going to confirm all of those in EDMAP, so I don't have to do that. And typically, I would be one of the verifiers, but it's happening more centrally. So there's a lot of interest in understanding what is happening with this pest. Um, just distribution, density, impact on garlic mustard, that kind of information. So pretty excited about this one. And this is a, a little different um, in that it's a, it's a pest of a pest and we really, we didn't introduce it. We don't know where it came from, but we're really interested in learning more. All right, I don't, I don't see any more questions. So I'm gonna keep going again for this one. The summary is if you have garlic mustard and you notice either an, an aphid, a tiny little insect or damage, we would like that reported to EdMaps. So that's what you're looking for. All right. And this one is a decidedly different type of project. So garlic, uh, so spotted lanternfly. If you're unfamiliar with spotted lanternfly, it's this very beautiful insect um, that can cause a tremendous amount of damage. And so kind of the, the details about spotted lanternfly are that it has, um, it has a larval stage of caterpillars that can be very detrimental. It can, they, they eat, they're generalists. They eat many, many, many plants across the landscape. Among them, they eat grapes, both domestic and wild. So they can be devastating to vineyards, um, but they, they really do eat lots of things. Uh, and it turns out that their entire life cycle from adults to egg masses, to laying egg masses on trees, um, to ca caterpillar emergence, can happen on a number of native and non-native plants, which is unusual. I'm gonna talk about that more in a moment. Typically they're more host specific. This one is not host specific, it's, it's very general. Um, and this insect um, is likely to cause a quarantine once it is found. It is a, it is a, uh, it's an insect for which we care a great deal about. We have been asking people to look for and report the insect, but there have been many efforts further east of using um, participatory surveillance, so participatory science volunteers, to look for these insects on targeted primary host species. So in much of the east, the primary host species is the tree of heaven, also an invasive plant. So if we were to go back to the noxious weed list, you would see tree of heaven is on it. And we have been list looking for tree of heaven. It might actually be up here. Let me see. Heaven, there it is. So yeah, it's on the eradicate list. Um, and so we have been looking for and killing tree of heaven when we found it only three times have we found it in the state of Minnesota, which they find to be crazy out east. It's a really common invasive plant further east of us. So we've been looking for this for a long time because tree of heaven has its own invasive problems and we don't want it. So we don't have the advantage, if you wanna call it that, um, of being able to have volunteers go out and survey tree of heavens to look for spotted lanternfly which is generally good news, but makes things awkward. Um, and we, tree, uh, spotted lanternfly has been known, it has egg masses like gypsy moth that it, it fixes to lots of things. Um, and, and it also moves really freely on materials. So it's been very commonly transported on railroad lines and railroad and, and trains. And so, um, 
there's a lot of effort putting in to look for and survey for spotted lanternfly on like railroad corridors and other transportation corridors. So this spring's participatory science project on spotted lanternfly is different in that we're asking people to go out and look at all of these spots. So every um, tag and marker here is a different location that we want people to go and look at. And this is an, it, on my screen, it's not interactive, this map, and we haven't made it interactive yet because we don't want people going out. It's too early to find spotted lanternfly. So even if it were present, you wouldn't be able to really find it and identify it right now. So we don't want people looking right now. So the lot, this is just an image and you can't click on it. But um, you will be able to click on these and then go in and through an app that we um, are gonna recommend people download, you'll be able to put in a report. And we're asking, targeting these five Southeastern counties. So Goodhue, Houston, Fillmore, Wabasha, and Winona counties, um, because that's where we think it is most likely to be introduced first. And we are asking people to very specifically look for presence and absence data at all of these points that we have predefined. And so here are the species, and it's, it's a weird list in Minnesota. Everybody is like, how, what? So I'm gonna talk you through it. So we know that spotted lanternfly can complete its life cycle on these first five species. And, and I'm gonna talk you through this because these are weird. So tree of heaven is a fully invasive tree. Roundleaf bittersweet is the new name for an invasive vine formerly known as oriental bittersweet. Both of these plants are in red because they're already on the Minnesota noxious weed list. Many people might be familiar with roundleaf bittersweet. We've done a lot of management around um, Winona, Red Wing, Southeast Minnesota to get rid of roundleaf bittersweet for a long time. It was on the Minnesota noxious weed eradicate list. We took it off and now it's on the control list. It's been moved down the list. So it's on the list, but further down. Happy to talk about that if you have questions in the Q&A. So these are already listed and in invasive plants. Then a spotted lanternfly complete its life cycle on native common hops, native river make, riverbait grape, and native, oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't complete its life cycle on riverbait grape. It completes its life cycle on American black walnut and butternut. And then it's very problematic on grapes. So it's super weird. Like these are, these are, this is a vine. These are trees. These are all different genera and families. It's super weird. Um, so common hops is a native vine uh, that, that it, it's a hops. Um, so it's what you could brew beer from. And we have an invasive vine, Japanese hops, that's also on the noxious weed list, hence in red. We do not know if spotted lantern fly can complete its life cycle on Japanese hops. We could find no reference points for that, but these are very similar and it makes us wonder. And if you were to find Japanese hops while you're looking for common hops, we want that reported in EDMAPS because it's an invasive species on the noxious weed list. Um, for this project in those five Southeast County areas in those designated points, we would also like you to report riverbank grape. So that's our native wild grape, American black walnut, that's black walnut, and then butternut. I ran a project about butternut last year. Um, because we want to know where those things are and have a presence absence for the presence or absence of spotted lanternfly. And then we may go back and visit these plants that are of particular import for this very problematic insect, spotted lanternfly. So I'm gonna go back over to here because that was a lot to take in and, and show you what is here. So I don't have all of this in my presentation because I want you guys all to go to the website. That was by design. Um, so actually, again, I need to change this to June, but we're gonna start this project. Here's a little bit about why it matters. Um, and then here are some great videos about spotted lanternfly. Um, here is, again, this is not updated. The link, does it go there? I didn't really want it to. So if it does, don't go there right now. It does, goes to the live map. So we're not ready for people to use it. Um, I should probably take that down, uh, but this is what it will look like. So I'll just show you what it looks like. Um, and you'll be able to pull this up on your phone, but then you could go in here and you could say, oh, this is a woodland cemetery and we want it to look there because many of these invasive plants are in the woodland cemetery. Um, here, there's a lot of boat landings. 
And so you can see this is a park for P, C is for campground, blue C is cemetery, F is fairgrounds, wayside, so think of like rest areas and then trails. And these are all places where spotted lanternfly has been found in the past. And then this is where I'll have that um, link to the live survey, but it's, it's not up yet. And then lots of great resources. This is a really big economic impact pest. So a lot of great resources from, uh, these are all from Pennsylvania State. Um, and then here is our round leaf bittersweet video. And then here are the, the identification information for these natives. So here's common hops, riverbank grape, great videos out of Purdue about black walnut identification and butternut identification. And then I'll just bounce over. This was a butternut project. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, that goes to a great identification tool. But I also did a butternut project that was completed last year. And so if one wanted to dive around, you could see. Um, but we were really looking for healthy butternuts because of the canker. So not to get too far off track, we were talking about spotted lanternfly. So all of the information will be here and we're really interested in tracking this. And I think I am ready to field any questions that might be coming at me. Hey, thank you, Angie, very good. Yeah, Angie's a part of our uh, invasive species team. Actually, she leads our invasive species team with the University of Minnesota Extension and then also involves uh, our horticultural team and some of that. And then also the state agencies of DNR and uh, also the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So she's very aware and I, has done these really nice websites to learn more about these invasive species that might be coming to our state. So thank you, Angie, for sharing that. Um, Laura, we got one Q&A left. Is that right? Yep, there's one question in Q&A. Um, they're just asking, where are the garlic aphids native to? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Asia, and I think I think China specifically, um, but I, I'm not 100% positive. Um, and, and I do think they're a host pest. I mean, they're a pest in the native crossover range of garlic mustard. Um, and we do not know how they got here. So it's a bit of a mystery. In the chat, I did put the TIPS project uh, Z link, I think, Angie. I think it's just z.umn.edu slash TIPS projects. Is that right? Yep. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Yes, you're welcome. And then Jenna mentions uh, we found some in our nature center. I think that might be uh, some of our uh, the squill question or the uh, Siberian pea shrub question. Yeah, and so all of these, everything, so um, all of the invasive species or the non-native species of concern get reported to EDMAPS. The exception this year would be the spotted lanternfly for that project, which again, hasn't fully launched. So if you were to find um, any of those invasive plants that I mentioned there, go ahead and report those to EDMAPS. But we'll have a separate kind of reporting app for that project because it's quite a bit more complicated. And then so you know, we will then pull all of the new invasive plant and invasive species reports directly from there to EDMAPS. And if you were to find spotted lanternfly anywhere in the state at any time, we would immediately want you to report that to EDMAPS. That will definitely turn some heads. There was one other question that just popped up in Q&A. Um, I would like to know how things go from the eradicate list to the control list. Yeah, I'm glad you asked. Um, so this is the list that we're talking about here. So this is the Minnesota Noxious Weed List. And here we have prohibit, eradicate, prohibit control, and restricted noxious weeds. And then we have this funny catch-all category, specially regulated. And each one of these has a different thing about it. So the directions here are not as clear because these are kind of the deal. And how things move. So there is a Minnesota, I'm going to just show you. This is the beauty of a webinar, right? So Minnesota Noxious Weed Advisory Committee. Um, so there is a group, the Minnesota, the Minnesota Noxious Weed Advisory Committee, that is tasked with reviewing all of the species on this. And so you can go um, and you can, let's see. There's the state statute that enables that committee, but I really want to look at, oh yeah, this is what I want. So that committee 
as a group identifies all of the plants that it thinks are of concern. And so this really lengthy list of plants that it's reviewed, and you can see the common name, the date it was most recently reviewed, and the scientific name. And if you were to count up the species on this list and cross-reference with the species on the noxious weed list, you would see that there are more species that have been reviewed than are on the noxious weed list. And that is because, okay, here we go. Um, that is because once they review these lists, these species, they don't always recommend them for the noxious weed list. So they're looking at things like, is it likely to be invasive? Um, is the policy of the noxious weed law likely to make a difference in its management? So if the noxious weed law is not gonna make a difference, then it doesn't make sense to put it on the list. And then it, it has to get voted on by the committee. So it goes through this comprehensive review. Uh, then they, the reviewers present the information to the committee. Then the committee has discussions, then the committee votes. If the committee votes for something to appear on the noxious weed list, they will make a recommendation about where it would appear on the noxious weed list. Um, and then that goes to the Minnesota Department of Agricultural Commissioner, and the commissioner has to approve or not the species and where it would be on the list. That same committee also looks at the list and they're trying to, to update it every three years. So they look at the list and they say, do we think these species are where they should be on this list or should they move? And I have seen this list change quite a number of times. Mostly species are added to the list, but sometimes they move from it. So as I said in my presentation, that um, that round leaf bittersweet, formerly called oriental bittersweet, had been on the eradicate list. And if you look now, it is here. It's on the control list. And what happened was once we really started upping our our surveillance around round leaf bittersweet, it turns out there was quite a bit more present in the state than we had realized. And while it persisted on the eradicate list and that gave them a lot of power to do immediate removal, it required landowners to kill it, uh, to kill it. that was super powerful. But in some areas, I'm, I'm thinking really sort of Red Wing and Winona, they had such large infestations that eradication feels pretty unmanageable. And so there had been you know, some internal consideration, like is it appropriate on the eradicate list or should it be removed down to the control list? And after a more recent review by the Noxious Weed Committee, they recommended it, that it be moved down and it was. Um, conversely, there have been many examples of where species have been on this list. And so one example that you might be familiar with is uh, Japanese barberry was for a long time on the specially regulated list. And then just in this last reiteration, uh, it moved up. So where is barberry now? Yeah, uh, there's common barberry and Japanese and it's on the restricted list now. And so I, since the list re, rejiggered in January, I'm still sort of remembering where things are. And, and this was kind of, it worked its way up, right? So the political compromise, it sat here for three years. So in sort of for practical species terms, um, trade, so nurseries could sell the last of their inventory and then it got moved up and now it's illegal to sell. Um, and, and if you, if anybody paid attention, when it was here, there were tons of cultivars that were legal or not legal. And now they've just, I think if we go in here, it will still list the cultivars, yeah. And so now you have to go in and look more closely and these are the cultivars that are regulated, I think is what this is gonna tell me. Um, yeah, so these cultivars are restricted. And the idea was that um, they would restrict those that had the most fruit because that's the most invasive part of it. So summary, the Minnesota Noxious Weed Advisory Committee regularly reviews species, and then they make recommendations to the Minnesota Department of Agriculture for adding species and moving them throughout the list. And so when I and others help me formulate which projects we should have in any given year, we actually look and pay attention to which species 
are likely to be reviewed by the Minnesota Noxious Weed List, and if we might be able to make a difference um, in informing the distribution and density or some other aspect that needs greater information uh, so that the Minnesota Noxious Weeds Advisory Committee can make the most informed decision. So this list from last year, I think it was, or the year before, was species that we knew they were going to be reviewing. And so this year, we're hopeful that mock strawberry might become a species to review. And then potentially one day it could be on the noxious weed list. Same with squill. That was a couple of years ago. That was a really long-winded answer. I have time, so I'm feeling very yeah. able to speak freely. Angie, I have a, one more comment uh, made yeah. from the Minnesota noxious weed law. So you as a as a homeowner the, to the audience here, uh, if you own any type of land, a half acre to a thousand acres, uh, you really need to know as a private landowner about the Minnesota noxious weed law. And you are obligated by law on those first two categories that Angie was talking about, eradicate and control. You are by law uh, entitled to basically encouraged, strongly encouraged to eradicate those if you find those uh, species on your property or control those species on your property. And I, I, I again, remember, uh, I think bull thistle was on the control list at one time and, and musk thistle and it was removed. With there, we only have two thistles, plumeless and, and Canada thistle now on the control list. But um, yeah, they, they seem to come and go on these lists. But uh, yeah, the, you as a homeowner really need to, and a property owner, you really need to know uh, what these species are and if you have them in your property and you need to do uh, either control or eradicate those first two categories. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gary. And to just to elaborate that a little bit more. So the eradicate list, it is the responsibility to kill the plant. That's the deal. And the idea is that these are not well established in the state. There are relatively few of them. And so this is not a huge task, right? So we're very worried about them. We believe them to have um, significant damage potential or, you know, ecological, economic or human health harm. And we want people looking for them and getting rid of them very quickly. And that it, that's that's required under state law. Um, the control list, the idea here is that you you can have these present on your property, but the idea is that you want to pro prohibit them from expanding their range, right? So Japanese knotweed is a bugger, both of the knotweeds, Bohemian or Japanese, um, to manage, but we, we don't want it to spread, right? So the, the sort of the requirement here is that you contain it, you keep it to the size it is. Now, ideally, we'd love it if it, you could get rid of it. But the, the law would require you to keep it at that same size. And then these on the restricted list are kind of like the cats out of the bag. We know their problems. You can't sell them. That's really important. We, they need to be on this list to prohibit sales in nursery industries. Um, so you can't sell them. You can't intentionally move or propagate them or sell propagating parts. The propagating parts thing can be a problem if you're like taking buckthorn to the brush dump and it's full of fruit. Technically, that's illegal um, because you don't want to like be spreading buckthorn berries all the way to the brush dump um, out the back of your trailer. I, I will tell you, enforcement is most concentrated on the eradicate list. So, you know, I don't know of anybody that's ever been stopped because buckthorn berries have been falling off the back of their truck, but we do not, I mean, like, you're not allowed to do that. Please don't do that. And then it requires a little bit more creative thought on how to manage stuff like that. Great Angie, comment. We, Angie, we have more questions. Uh, yes, more? let's go. Yep, there's quite a few questions that are popping up in Q&A. Um, next one is, what species haven't entered Minnesota yet, but you're concerned about on the horizon? Yeah, it is a great question. It's a great question. And so um, I am going to, you're going you're gonna to watch me. Can I, where can I? Um, I know where I want to go. I don't know the best way to get there. Uh, you're going to watch me kind of stumble around in my calendar for a brief moment. So Forest Pest First Detector is a program that many of you are familiar with, hopefully, maybe. And um, we, every single year in the fall, we assess uh, where what we are worried about for this coming year. And, um, and we look at it from the context of invasive species problematic in our forests. And then which ones we think volunteers or, or for forest pest protection, first detector to some degree, professionals can really adequately define, identify, and report. Um, and so this is the agenda from Forest Pest First Detector this year. 
And you can see these are the species that we are really worried about. So spotted lanternfly, which we've already talked about, tree of heaven, which we've talked about, round leaf bittersweet, we talked about. Asian longhorn beetle, this has been on our list for years and years and years. We are very worried about that. It attacks maple trees and others, and it often has strong um, quarantines and, and eradication has been successful with Asian longhorn beetle, but it includes things like getting rid of all maple trees in a one to five mile radius. So it's a huge deal. Emerald ash borer persists because it isn't in all counties and we really wanna look for it. Oak wilt is popping up as a bigger problem in central Minnesota and we're really likely to deploy volunteers to look for oak wilt in central Minnesota this summer. There are a number of vines that are kind of popping up that have us worried. So these are, we call them vining milkweed. So they have milkweed like pods and they can be an ecological sink for, spot, uh, for monarch butterflies. So monarchs um, have been seen to lay their eggs on these vines, potentially confusing them with common milkweed. Then the eggs hatch and the larvae emerge and they can't, they don't have a food source. They need common milkweed and they're on the wrong plant. So those plants are rough potato and pale and black swallowwort. Um, we've been worried on and off about Russian and autumn olive. So those are uh, types of shrubs that are quite common invasive either further east or further west of us. Uh, European mountain ash. So we have a native mountain ash, but there's a European mountain ash that is really um, starting to pop up in the Duluth area, which is concerning. Stilt grass is a grass um, and it's in an invasive grass, it's really hard to manage once it gets in forested stands, but very importantly, uh, it also changes the fire regime. So once you have stilt grass in a stand, and if you want to try to burn it, it burns really hot and flashy, and it makes doing things like prescribed burns or other uh, burning treatments really unpredictable and unsafe. And this is a big problem further south. We don't want it. Yellow arch angel and periwinkle are both sold in trade. For the workshop, I was able to literally dump online and buy them, and they were delivered in less than a week to my house. Um, and they're common understory, they, they are commonly planted as understory shade tolerant plants to put in your yard. So that was maybe a longer answer than you wanted, but these are the species that we were most worried about for forest pest versus detector this year. Okay. Thank you, Angie. Uh, I don't have much on the chat, but Jenna mentions uh, uh, the previous question on the Nature Center was the squill that they were finding, and they did report it to EdMaps. Excellent. Thank you very much. And if anybody's not familiar with squill, I'll just bounce over there while Gary can read me the next question. But this is um, th this is definitely starting to show up right now. Um, it's a project we did a couple of years ago, and um, and still continue to report it. We want it. We want, we what we do is we continually go back and assess the distribution and density data that's in Med, EdMaps every time we have a question about it. So keep putting information because that just updates our records and we look at it. Well, well this one kind of goes along with this. Uh, which yeah. apps or sites are preferred for reporting invasives? It seems like there's several out there. Yeah. No, we are really um, committed to EdMaps. So we want all invasives in the state of Minnesota to report it to EdMaps. I strongly recommend, strongly recommend you do this with your phone, right? Oh, all kinds of people are trying to get a hold of me. Um, so do that with your phone and it, it's super lickety split. If you are very resistant to phones, you can also report a sighting right here on the EdMaps website. That is totally up to you. But there's no confusion in Minnesota. We want every invasive species. So that can be insects, plants, it can be aquatics, it can be snails, it can be um, you know, wild hogs, anything we want put into EdMaps. There are a few times where my participatory science projects have used other tools like iNaturalist. Um, so when I did um, bettering butternut last year, butternuts are native. So it's inappropriate to put them into an invasive species database. Uh, and so we needed to use iNaturalist. The reason we did the project was in part because of invasive butternut canker, but we weren't really looking for that, right? So um, I do sort of switch between these two and the spotted lanternfly, because that is very complicated and we're looking for presence, absence data at predefined locations that will initially be put in to um, an ArcGIS database that the, or, or app platform that the MDA has specifically created for this project. Um, and so that's a bit of a deviation from the message, but the answer is EdMaps. And, and so I'm not gonna go into iNaturalist. It is 
great. If you're unfamiliar with iNatural, strongly recommend it for identifying anything that's ever lived. Um, and my blog, I think on my Minnesota woods in about a week and a half will be how to do EDMAP projects. So look for that because I really am a big fan of EDMAP projects and I think they're super useful for landowners. I see more questions, so I'm going to stop talking and let you answer, ask questions. Uh, this one also has to do with the reporting. Um, is yep. it helpful to continue to report the items you're studying every year if we see something in the same place as previously reported? Question. Mark. Excellent question. Excellent question. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So if we already have a report from that location, it is not helpful unless something significant has changed. And so let me, um, I said mock strawberry. Let me, I think this is a decent example and it's one that we have already talked about. And this is called false strawberry in, uh, in NMAP. So that's a bit awkward. Um, oh, so was I right? Let's see. I thought there were presence absence ones on mock strawberry, but I see I was misremembering, darn it. Um, so the answer is yes. If there is something new or emerging, um, we for sure want that. So I'm trying to think. Let's see. What I, I want to show you, I'm trying to just think of a good species. Let's look at garlic mustard. So this is what we do. I mean, um, this is for sure what we do. As you can see, garlic mustard aphid is there. Excellent. Okay. This is what I wanted. So you see these things on the right. So we have positive yes presence treated. So somebody's working on it. So if you were to go out there and treat, so let's say you marked Amher cork tree because it was in your boulevard and then the city comes down and takes it out and you wanna go back and say, well, it was treated. You can put it in as treated because now it's been removed. You can even put that one in potentially as eradicated if it's an individual. If it's in a naturalized area, it takes years to prove eradication because you need to look for seed source. Um, and, and typically we don't ask volunteers to do that. But if it's at your nature center and you've been working on it, strongly recommend you go in there and you um, update or change that. And this is what it looks like on the ground in these maps. And you can see Minnesota is really active in using these platforms in this way. And so remember, so this was, oh, where did my key go? So blue is negative. So they went there and they looked and they didn't find it. I'm looking at garlic mustard, if you recall. But right here in Ely, there were reports of garlic mustard, so present, and then here they've been treating it. And we totally use this information. Hopefully that answered the question. Uh, last one. I've been hearing discussions about reframing how we think about non-natives and invasive species in a less negative way, given the environment is always changing and species are generally always moving and considering more rapid change of the climate. Any thoughts on this? I do. So I think there's a couple of things that are bouncing around, um, bouncing around in that mind. Um, so first I wanna say that invasive species, professionals have been thinking about invasive species for a really long time. And we're pretty committed to that definition of a non-native plant that causes economic, ecological, or human health harm, right? Um, we can see that it's hard to prove some of those things and it can take a long time. So uh, there is an effort to sort of reframe species that are successful. So you, you can certainly make a good argument that invasive species are successful. And in our changing climate, we need to be more understanding of those. And it's, an, it's a fair consideration that I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of put that on pause for a minute because I'm gonna circle back to it. Um, because I think that you could also really um, prioritize natives in the same way, but then you get into things like, but it turns out some of our most successful natives, we often term as weeds, right? So then maybe we need to think what is a weed, which is a plant out of place, a plant somewhere where you don't want it. Um, and then we have a whole, so I want to say, then we have folks so I'm thinking really of traditional ecological knowledge. Um, so indigenous Americans and, and uh, the way they have approached species through time. 
And they often look at, so I want to just own, there are many tribes in the United States and they all are different and they all have different cultures and I don't want to summarize them, but there are a few similarities in that they tend to have really long time horizons that they're looking for in stewarding, like seven generations forward. Um, and so they really view things differently. And so one example I was actually talking yesterday about was common valerian. It's a non-native plant that, that is often considered to be invasive. It's not currently listed. Um, I'll just show you where it is. And it's becoming quite, quite prevalent on the North shore of Minnesota. Um, valerian, I don't know how to spell it. Valerian, there it is. Um, but the Fond du Lac tribe, it has some medicinal value. And so they have decided they do not want it listed, the Fond du Lac tribe. And they're, they're fairly vocal about this because they view it to be a new relative. So in their way of thinking, all, um, all species are, are a part of our same larger uh, family on earth. And, and that this is one that is, is new to their, to their space, but it, it, it creates value to their community. And so they're resistant to um, it being regulated like on the Minnesota noxious weed list. Uh, which doesn't apply on tribal lands, but um, does have implications. And so it's it's really an interesting way of thinking about it, right? So where are those sweet spots? And like I said, we don't ever think of apple as troublesome. We have a great deal of pride in our apples. Honeybees are completely non-native. And yet, my gosh, how many pollinator plantings and, and how many people have their, are getting their hives out right now? And I'm a big fan of honey, right? So it is a very complicated relationship. Um, I also want to say there's also a whole different thing going on with naming in invasive species, which I really won't talk about, but it kind of bounces around the human impact of the way in which we frame and talk about invasive species and the, what we call them. So oriental bittersweet is now round leaf bittersweet. Um, so what used to be gypsy moth is now spongy moth. There's this whole effort because, because those names and the way we frame work around those species was actually causing harm to people. And I feel like we really saw this when there was a time when a, the president was calling coronavirus China virus and then people were getting physically attacked. Same kind of issue. But I want to end on a happier note. So um, I just put out this week this blog, Rewild in Your Backyard Woods, Planting for the Eastern Central Hardwood Forest. And this is a lot of words, but it's a list right here. This was, in my opinion, one of the challenges that I commonly run into with invasive plants is that they've escaped from um, intentional horticultural plantings. And if we could have good plant lists that were native, then the species by definition can never become invasive. Um, and can we de develop these that are climate resilient, native, and then are beneficial to our charismatic microfauna. So think of the little things that make up the base of our ecosystem. And I'm delighted to say that the first list is out today. The second blog with trees should come out for Arbor Day. I don't think it's been posted yet, but it's on its way out. Um, and then this is the understory plant list. And so some of these plants, prickly ash, they're kind of funny to recommend, right? Because it's prickles. Um, zigzag goldenrod, some people view that to be weedy. Maybe it's just successful, which is I think what the questioner was sort of noodling about, right? This is native, so it can't be invasive, but, it, and then you see wood nettle is on there. Not every day do you see that on a recommended list because um, that one stings. It's also edible and it's got, um, you know, ecological benefits to little critters. So this is a different way, that same kind of thing, but we've started with the, the Minnesota DNR's native plant, plant community list to generate this list of species. Um, and then we've, we've taken out the species that are unlikely to be climate resilient. And then we have um, then only listed the species that also are friendly to the little, the little critters. And this is what's remaining. And it's also part of my effort to reduce the amount of non-native species introduced so we have fewer invasives. That was a lot. Hopefully that answered the question. In chat, we have some uh, clay comments that the honeybees have been in the US over 13 million years ago. Let's see, pursuant to 14 million years ago, honeybee fossils have been found in the US. You know, along that, that line, Clay, uh, actually ginkgo leaves have been found in North Dakota in fossils. So, uh, you know, maybe the ginkgo tree was native to Minnesota. How about that? I've been trying to work with our conservation uh, groups, uh, uh, NRCS and so forth, is making a conservation tree. But uh, yeah, uh, interesting. It, it hasn't been native recently, let's put it that way. But uh, yes, uh, I, I agree. You're probably right. 
uh, fossils of uh, different plants and insects and animals have been found uh, in this area probably uh, millions of years ago, which is pretty pretty interesting. They are not not uh, considered native now. Thank you. And Laura, Lauren, you have one more question there. Uh, it's just a comment. Somebody said, thank you so much for talking about all this around the naming and language used regarding the invasive. I especially appreciate you informing us of the way of thinking of people who have been here and understood their environment for far longer than much of the population of the, of North America. Yeah, no, it's it, there's really interesting conversations and some of them are kind of um, brain twisters, right? Sometimes I feel like I have to hear it and sit with it for a little while and then like think about how it can be applied and then circle back to it. And so I found that to be um, a helpful practice, right? When there's something that really challenges my thoughts, like maybe I just need to sit and reflect a little bit and circle back. And I think we're really starting to do that um, with more intent, um, which is good. I think, I think this is all a journey right? I have no doubt that some of the names that I'm using today will not be the names of the future. And some of the things that we think are bad are going to be good and vice versa, right? So we're all in a learning journey. And I'm really grateful that participatory science is a way in which we can all learn together because we do not have all the answers and we're still trying to figure it out. So thank you for your help. Yeah, thank you. Angie, can you stop sharing? And I've got some final slides for of the day. Of course. Please. Thanks, Gary. And here we go. Let's see if we full screen. Yes, thank you, Angie. What an excellent presentation on uh, Pacific Story Science with spotted lanternfly and mock strawberry and, and garlic mustard aphids. Please participate in that uh, websites that uh, Angie has been showing you today. That's great. Uh, her contact information is there and email. And also, we are going to have these recorded webinars recorded at the Z link, z.umn.edu slash Fridays with an S. And this is our last Zoom for this season, but you can see the list of what we had there and what we have posted on our uh, Z-Link uh, on Fridays with a Forester. So as you end today's Zoom, uh, you'll have an evaluation opportunity to evaluate the Zoom today and give us some comments for next year's programs. So if you're not receiving a monthly newsletter from My Minnesota Woods and want to, certainly uh, you can access the Z-Link here z.umn.edu slash my Minnesota Woods. Actually, you can spell that out and find it too. And then you can email uh, us to make sure you get on that list. Again, recordings of the My Minnesota or, or Fridays with a Forester are recorded at the Z link, z.umn.edu slash Fridays. And we thank you for attending today and, and the season of uh, Fridays with a Forester this year. Appreciate your attendance. It's been very good. And uh, we're uh, really happy to bring you these types of webinars and educational programs uh, via Zoom. Thank you, Angie, again, and Lauren for helping manage the uh, webinar today. Thank you.